Hello, welcome to episode two of the Research Comms podcast. Thanks for tuning in and thanks especially to those who already listened to the first episode. That was my interview with a science communicator and science poet, Sam Illingworth. I've had some lovely comments actually from people about that episode, which I'm going to read out a couple if you don't mind, I hope. One is from Tay Yiba Aziz, who wrote on Twitter, also known as at SciComm Tay. She said, what a great start to the series. Thoroughly enjoyed it and can't wait for future episodes. Well, thanks very much, Tay. And uh, you don't actually have to wait anymore. Here it is, episode two. Another one. Let's have a look. From Kelly Stanford, a.k.a. The Lab Artist, who wrote... And I'll have to explain this one in a second. She wrote, I rate rate this podcast nine pissy pools out of ten, which doesn't, I must admit, sound very complimentary. But if you have listened to the first episode, you will understand. Uh, Sam reads out a poem about some research into detecting urine levels in public swimming pools. So nine pissy pools out of ten in this context is, uh, I think, very complimentary. So thanks very much, Kelly. Anyway, enough of that. Let's move on into the nitty gritty of episode two. And this week we are looking in on ourselves a little bit, going a bit introspective with a podcast all about podcasts. My guest this week is Emily Elias, who's the producer and presenter of an excellent podcast series, my favourite one out there at the moment, I'd say, my favourite science one, which is called the Oxford Sparks Big Questions podcast. It's really fantastic. If you haven't listened to it, you really ought to. Um, I'll include links in the blog accompanying this podcast uh, to some of my favourite episodes. But just to give you kind of an overview, it's these short little nuggets, 15, 20 minutes long, of really well-crafted science research storytelling from Emily. And so I met up with Emily a little while ago to chat to her about her approach to podcast making to see if I could glean some insights into how to communicate effectively communicate research through the podcast form i should mention that because it was a lovely day when we met this was a little while ago a few weeks maybe a couple of months we decided to conduct the interview outside in a lovely park area and um, it was delightful but as is always the case in london that meant that there's a certain amount of background noise mostly in the form of airplanes flying overhead I think I've eliminated the most distracting examples, but I thought I would mention it uh, in advance, just yeah, to give you a bit of a heads up. I don't think it's too bad. I hope not. It was a really lovely day, and it would have been criminal to sit inside. So um, that's that. Anyway, I hope you enjoy it. Hi, Emily. Hi. Here we are. Uh, we should probably set the scene a little bit because it's there is a certain amount of ambient noise going on. Where, where are we today? We are in the beautiful Woodbury wetlands in North London. It is a little oasis hidden away behind the council houses. It genuinely feels like you're not in London right now. It is very nice, but um, we're not here to talk about the wetlands specifically. Not today. Uh, we are here to talk about podcasts. So thanks very much for agreeing to come along. As I mentioned in the intro, I found out about you through your work producing the Oxford Sparks podcasts. Um, so perhaps you could talk a little bit about that, about yeah, what, what that podcast series is all about. So Oxford Sparks is a way we want to make Oxford researchers not sound stuffy and boring and actually show that they're doing really cool things um, that impact everybody in the world around us. So we're trying to take you know Oxford's research out of the labs, out of the lecture halls, and make it engaging and exciting to your everyman. Not just to somebody who's taken their GCSEs in science to a certain point, but to most people. Everybody can follow a story, everybody has a really basic rudimentary knowledge of science and how it affects their lives. So all we're just trying to do is amplify that and make them see that Oxford isn't this big scary institution, it's got really cool things going on and they can learn all about it. Fantastic, great description and it is a really wonderful series. Highly recommend people listening to it if they haven't done already. And it's very varied, isn't it? I mean, if you could give some examples of the kind of topics that you cover. Yeah, so we've called it the Big Questions podcast and what we try to do is take about 10 minutes to tackle one big question that researchers are dealing with. Um, and some of them are very kind of niche and specialist, like one person was doing research about a science, a mathematician symposium in the 1930s and it, uh, the Cold War sort of mathematicians getting involved in it and then being removed from it. So it has like a very sort of like neat story of going on there that you wouldn't necessarily know about. Another one we did was about 
uh, another researcher, Eleanor Stride, who does work with bubbles and she f is figuring out a way of making a drug delivery system in, that can be enclosed in bubbles that are so small they can fit into our bloodstream and then we can kind of direct them to where uh, say cancer cells are uh, and then rupture the bubbles there and so the drugs are delivered right to the spot where the tumor is as opposed to having to go through something horrendous like chemotherapy where you have to basically poison your entire body. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, that sounds fascinating and, and my particular favorite uh, podcast probably I imagine one that gets quite a lot of attention is the one about the sex lives of the fruit flies yes which you did as a sort of karaoke yeah theme. we <laughs> we took some I took some researchers who watch fruit flies have sex all day long <laughs> and I brought them to a karaoke bar I think a natural place where <laughs> relationships evolve yeah and we sang uh, adult contemporary power ballads um, about the different stages of how they mate and we learned all about the life cycle of these bugs through, I think, some wonderful songs. It's very good. My favourite, really. Um, it's just such a creative way of communicating interesting science, really inventive. And I will include a link to that and to other episodes in the blog post that accompanies this podcast. There seems to be a lot of hype at the moment, isn't there, around podcasts and their popularity. So. What is it, do you think, that makes them so appealing at the moment? Um, I think it's different for all people. I think we're now in a society where we get our media on demand more. We're not necessarily like going to watch the six o'clock news at that time. Mm. With like Netflix and iPlayer, we're kind of more used to things being on demand now. And with podcasts now being an app that's on your phone, that's in your pocket, you don't have to do much work to find it. They're more, more access, much more accessible. Mm. I think that's kind of really helped tip it. And then you've had some really amazing podcasts like Serial and S-Town and all the sort of This American Life sort of branded material and content where people realize that this is something cool that they want to listen to. This is a documentary for the ears or they see a celebrity that they really like or a topic that they're interested in and they're allowed to be geeks and they're allowed to feel like they're a part of a community and really grow with that. Mm. I know co like podcasts have been going on for like years now and it's just the fact that more people are talking about them more people are engaging with them that i think that's really what has made more people sort of go to them as a way of finding information who do you have in mind when you're making the oxford sparks podcast what is the target uh, i think the target is just you're every man we don't want to create something that isn't engaging with people and i know that sounds really like public engagement 101 but I always think of like my friends and family members. I think of you know people who aren't necessarily university educated but still have interest in things. A lot of people I think love having that fun fact where they go to the pub and they're like, "Hey, did you hear this thing about like sausages?" <laughs> and <laughs> is there a thing about sausages? Do you have a fun fact? <laughs> Do I have a fun fact about sausages? They are not going to. Well, they may give you cancer, but in a very small <laughs> amount. Oh right, okay. Yeah. We did a podcast about whether or not bacon and sausages, car meats will give you cancer. Excellent, so we're uh, still okay to eat it. We're still okay to eat it, but Good. just not in a very large amount. Um, <laughs> nice. Yeah, so people, I think, love knowing something. People love sharing information. Uh, and so when I'm trying to figure out what audience a story is for, I just kind of try to like break it back of like, what do I think is interesting in this? And what is that sort of like elevator pitch that I would tell a friend of like, hey, I'm doing this cool thing and it's about mole rats. And did you know, I have no facts about mole rats, that's a bad example. Uh, <laughs> but, but it's kind of like when you kind of really strip it back to the really basic informational of how we actually talk to our friends. Yeah. What is your background? Is, do you come from a science background yourself? No, I do not come from a science background at all. And uh, at first, like you could think that might be intimidating to start walking into this like science world mm -hmm. where you don't have all of the knowledge that these people have dedicated their lives to you and you're juggling lots of varied topics from like a Mars mission to a medical trial. Yeah. Um, but I think because of that, it gives me the permission to ask dumb questions and I love a dumb question. And so it kind of helps them then realize that like, oh wait, this is this is somebody who isn't in my field might actually really be curious about yeah. and I should then kind of walk it back from there. And I always feel like if I can understand it as a non-science person, everybody else can understand yeah. it. Like I'm a fairly good litmus test of whether it makes sense or not. Yeah. Um, and I kind of try and 
kind of go from there. People who might be listening to this would be people who are considering potentially doing podcasts themselves or have just started out doing them. They could be people working within research organisations. How would you sort of give them advice on taking themselves out of the specialist role and putting the hat of a non-specialist on so that they can speak in an accessible way to people? Because I think that's quite a, di- a challenge sometimes for whether it's scientists, social scientists who are so sort of immersed in the subject to be able to kind of look beyond. So I sometimes just say to people, talk to me like I'm an excited teenager like I have a bit of knowledge I don't necessarily have the great deal of knowledge that you have I want to know what you're saying I'm I care about what you're saying but you just have to explain it to me in that way I mean there's lots of academics or fancy science people technical term um, (laughs) (laughs) who want to make a podcast that's for other fancy science people Mm. and that's totally allowed and you can do that but make sure that you, they know that's the audience, yeah. so it isn't alienating to somebody else yeah, who is, sure. doesn't necessarily have that knowledge base. And so you said in terms of when you're deciding what goes in, because you're faced with a massive subject, such as you are saying, so you're doing one about Mars exploration, and you know you need to whittle that down into sort of a 15-minute or so podcast. How do you go about sort of whittling it down and working out what people are going to find most engaging from a sort of story, I guess, a, is it a sort of storytelling point of view, really, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's kind of, it's the story. It's, are you focusing on the mission itself or are you focusing on the researcher or the person? Are you focused, we kind of, it gets to that issue of focus. Like I used to work at the CBC for eight years and pretty much before you were sent out to do any form of like documentary type storytelling for them, they really made you kind of like hammer in. You've done all your research before you kind of go and hit record on the tape. What is the focus of your story? So-and-so is doing this because blank. And so when you kind of put that sentence together, uh, you know, researcher X is doing curing cancer because blank, that really helps you then figure out where you're going to go and take the narrative. I think, you know, it's really kind of, it's fun to go out and record people and talk to them and do all that great stuff and see their world. But if you don't have a focus to it, you could end up back home with like, 20 hours of tape and then you're like great I've got to turn this into 15 minutes that's not doing anybody a service that's just making life harder for everyone in the long run so I think a really key element of like when you're going out to do a podcast is have a focus and kind of know where you're going Mm. you can have a fun time getting there but at least kind of have a focus of statement to follow yeah so the podcast you do 15 minutes in length how did you decide on that length we kind of landed on it just because we found just looking at analytics and things like that of what is actually digestible for someone to take in of like a fairly like heavy subject we didn't want to make it too long that it felt like oh do i really want to dedicate 40 minutes of my life to (laughs) antimatter and and people roll their eyes you know also listen like when you look at how people listen to podcasts people listen to them as they're doing things they listen to them as they're commuting Mm -hmm. or as they're making dinner or you know any sort of activity where they're not watching a television so wanted to make it that if they did need to listen to it again or they missed something Mm -hmm. it wasn't like you know oh i missed that that two minutes that five minutes and now the the remaining 30 doesn't make sense to me yeah and it just kind of became something that would be digestible and shareable it didn't seem like a big ask but you would still get a lot of information out of it. So that's kind of how we ended up on that link. So to get to that, to those 15 minutes of podcast gold, how much work is involved? Take us through the process a bit. Okay, so I'm going out on a story and I've done some pre-research calls, some interview chats, and I've kind of got to figure out where it's going. Bring my gear, we'll meet, we'll do an interview. Uh, If they're in a different location, they'll show me around, we'll kind of do sort of things two or three different times just to make sure that I get the different sounds of it. And then when you get to the editing process, it kind of can feel a bit daunting because you have all of this tape, um, but that I like to take notes of like where things are and I kind of make a rough clip trim of what the different sounds are, what the different clips and things that I thought were good. Or if we're in an interview setting, I'll note down the time code or, you know, kind of always have my eye on the counter mm. or, and a notebook and a pen nearby. Um, And then when it gets to editing, it's kind of going through things, piecing a jigsaw puzzle together of different bits and bobs to try and make it flow. Sometimes, you know, you nail it on one and sometimes you're just like stuck on a couple turns of phrase that you can't just like, you can't seem to get through and you have to walk away from it yeah and take a break and take a breath (laughs) (laughs) Um, and then editing it is a job unto itself. I 
I use pretty, probably like four or five tracks of, of in a mix um, just to try and like emphasize the right things and get it to flow correctly. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, all said and done, it would take me like four or five days to do a podcast. Right. That incorporate the research, research time and, yeah, and everything. Right. Yeah. Just, yeah. And, it, and that's just like to make sure, like even when you've done, you've done an edit on it, you still then go back and re-listen to it and you find different little things mm -hmm. and it kind of becomes like this perfectionist yeah. correcting because there's one sort of like weird edit everybody hears it and that's yeah. like the one thing in the final product then like everybody hears yeah and you have to do that yourself you don't have like another sure. person that can listen to it and fix the yeah things so you have to become very good at at self-control and, and figuring out of your time of how much to dedicate and yeah. juggle are there characteristics that are shared are you are the kind of key ingredients that make any su podcast successful that you think so is there a, is there a secret to podcasting that everybody's got like some magic fairy dust and they sprinkle uh, on and they're like oh yeah that's brilliant yeah I suppose that well I mean if there is that would be great to I hear. would love some fairy <laughs> dust if it does exist uh, no I think that it's just what you want to do in any sort of like podcast or project is you know the researchers and the people who know this stuff have I always feel like they've done a huge service to me by even talking to me about it like I always feel very like like uh, honored feels like a weird word to mm. use uh, and so what I want to do is I just want to make them sound great mm. and I want and if they sound great then other people I think will connect with what they're saying yeah they, they don't want to sound boring <laughs> <No>. <laughs> they want to they sound like everybody wants to sound engaging and yeah. cool and so that's something that you can get on board with yeah and I think that's what you have to try and do is you have to try as a podcast producer, help bring people's personalities out Great. and then really showcase that so that you do have these sorts of stories that people want to share uh, and people, we're getting attacked by bugs <laughs> yeah, right now. <laughs> a fly in my head. <laughs> this seems like such a great idea until the bugs attack. <laughs> uh, yeah, but you want to make people want to listen and you want to keep them listening for that 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, however long it is. Yeah. And I think the best way to do that is through personality and character and, mm -hmm. and really making people want to know what they're thinking and how they think there are a lot i think because that everybody sees them being so popular that means that there has been an explosion of the number of podcasts around which also means that it's harder for, for those that do exist to kind of get heard and to stand out do you, do you have any advice of once people have created the podcast what they can then do with it to try and really make sure it gets heard for your everyman, uh, which has now become like my favorite phrase in this <laughs> podcast, for your normal hobby potty podcaster, I think the best thing you can try and do is build a community around what you're doing. Yeah. Don't, while podcasting can be really isolating because you're editing audio by yourself, you're talking to one person, you know, for that podcast or whatever it may be, but mm. essentially a lot of the grunt work falls on you as a solo person. If you're, It can be kind of lonely or not necessarily in a team. But if you have a way of trying to build a community around what you're doing, getting out there, doing events, uh, finding the people with similar interests and disseminating it that way, like podcasts do have kind of a nice sort of like organic feel to them and how they get spread around. So I think that that then becomes what you need to do and focus on is just connecting with other people, having other people on as guests, making other, getting into their social circles and making people aware and spreading it that way. I think that becomes really important and what you should focus on as a podcaster is yeah. being a part of, of a, a greater community. Yeah, that's great. And I think that probably applies across the board to any kind of if you're trying to increase engagement with whatever you're producing, whether it is video, podcast, any, a blog, whatever, it's, it's that developing community isn't it of interested engaged individuals but I suppose that takes time itself it does and that's <laughs> why like I honestly have so much respect for people who do this as a hobby and who are doing it by themselves mm. because it's a ton of work yeah. and I think sometimes when you're just saying oh, I'm gonna have a podcast yeah and it sounds like a really easy thing mm. to pull off um, but that's why there can be so much noise of not very good podcasts. Yeah, yeah. And you have to find a way of cutting through that noise. And it's those little extra steps of like doing a live event or mm. meeting other like-minded people or having mm -hmm. other guests on that can really help make you stand out. Yeah. And it's like, it's a, it is a lot of work and it's a big ask. So yeah. I, like, I caution people not to go into pop making podcasts lightly yeah. and like not expecting like, I'm gonna do one episode it's going to go viral. <laughs> yeah. Everybody's going to love it. And that is going to be the thing. Yeah. Because 
podcasts grow over time. Mm -hmm. You know, most successful podcasts have back catalogs of Mm. hundreds of episodes because it took time to get to the point where they are now a really successful podcast. Yeah, and not just just in terms of, I suppose, growing the audience, but also in terms of making better podcasts. Because you probably start out, you haven't done it before, you're not, it shouldn't be great. Yeah. Because that's the whole point, isn't it? Exactly. Like, yeah. Don't expect your first podcast to go gangbusters of like, oh, I completely nailed radio production (laughs) on the first crack. Yeah. Because it is a learning process and each podcast will slightly sound different. You know, maybe by episode seven, you figured out that you like to do this sort of treatment better than what you had in episode Mm -hmm. one. And then by episode 40, you're like, oh, I think I've nailed the music or something like that. And it's kind of an evolutionary process of of creating and building. Yeah. Like you're not going to make cereal. Yeah. Like rule number one (laughs) of getting into a podcast. Don't go into the illusion that you're going to make cereal. Uh, <laughs> I think that you can get really discouraged really fast if that's what your goal is. Like, set a reasonable goal of what you think engagement is to you mm. or what you think good numbers are for you. And then be really satisfied with that. And then, you know, reassess in a few months of yeah. what you think would be a better audience. Like, grow with it. Don't try and make it the biggest thing in the world. Yeah, It would be great as well, just from a sort of technical point of view, what do people need? How easy is it to equip yourself um, to create both recording and editing and uploading and so on? It, I mean, it completely depends on like the standard of podcast that you're comfortable with putting out there. Because if you wanted to just record it on your phone and upload it, like there are apps that are designed to do that for mm. you and you can do that. But it's the same sort of thing of like, if you're going on vacation and you've spent and you're really excited to go, are you going to take your pictures only with your iPhone or are you going to have an SLR camera? Yeah. It's kind of like that question of how much do you want to invest yeah. in it? Um, I think it's always good to have a solid state like recording device that is job is only to record things. Mm-hmm. I think that is like a really good starting yeah. point if you want to have a podcast. Uh, but they don't have to cost cost the earth. No, do and they? they don't cost the earth. Yeah. Or even if you buy something secondhand, yeah. like you can still get really good functioning kit uh, that will get a really high quality version of that audio. Um, Microphones are great. Love a microphone. Mm -hmm. Uh, Depends on what kind of environment you're in of what microphone you would need, whether you'd want to have a shotgun microphone or whether you'd want to have sort of a cardioid, like what we usually see reporters running Mm. around with. Um, I think one like sort of good workhorse, like cardioid microphone is like with a nice like sock on it, like Mm -hmm. a foam cover, like that's ace. You can you have to do the radio thing where get really friendly with them, make sure that the microphone is close to their face and not like on a table far away yeah, from yeah, them. Yeah. So you can actually use the fact that you got this good mm-hmm. piece of technology. And I think one of the main things is headphones. Yeah. And I cannot say this enough. Always listen as you're recording because if there's a weird hum or a refrigerator mm. or an airplane, or an airplane. <laughs> exactly. you can hear it and you can make that judgment in the moment of if that's too distracting, do I need to have them redo it? Or if it's fine, the listener won't even notice. I'm having a think about that now. I think it's okay. I, I mean, th- we've had a few, so we've I apologize for that, but it's nicer to have sometimes a free flowing conversation, I think, than stopping and starting constantly. So, <laughs> so that's the recording side of thing. Editing, how do you edit yours? Um, well, <laughs> free wise, uh, Audacity. Oh, tends okay. to be like a, a decent like kit for people to use. I find it incredibly frustrating because it is so counterintuitive to how I want the program to work right. that I'm willing to pay right. <laughs> for yeah. something that like actually makes my life easier. Yeah. And I think that's kind of like a threshold you have to cross mm-hmm. of like, how much are you willing to pay? Yeah. Um, Hindenburg, I think is great for beginners. Okay. They have like a journalist pro thing. It's about 30 pounds or so i want to say for like a year oh right okay well that's pretty and then they have and then they have uh once a year they do like a radio i think it's mid-february they have world radio day and they'll sell licenses for one euro oh wow and like if you get like if you are thinking about it and you hold out to february and you get your one one euro license it pays for itself yeah yeah weight and gold and it's just really instinctive software Mm. You move a dial up, the audio moves up. You yeah. move it down, it moves down. Yeah, that's you cut what it, you need. yeah. You cut paste whatever. And then I personally, I use Audition, Adobe Audition, expensive, but it's I'm a pro, so yeah. I can I can write that justify off on my taxes yeah, and yeah. justify it that way. <laughs> and then uploading. Uploading, I uh, use Libsyn as a uploader. Okay. Uh, I think that's really kind of just for me. 
I've always used it. It's really instinctive, but there are tons of other programs that you can use. And if you ever run into any sort of like problem where you have no idea what you're doing with it and you're lost, thank God there is YouTube because mm. somebody has run into this problem yeah. before and podcasters are a really friendly group and they yeah. tend to like screen grab a YouTube video mm -hmm. <laughs> every issue they've had. Nice. So there's always some way if you get lost, there's someone to help you. Yeah. If possible, I suppose it'd be good to just kind of round things off. Are there sort of three things that people should be considering i mean i'm sure there are dozens but like three kind of takeaways that people might be able to take away oh <laughs> i've got some takeaways okay uh, i i think picking up on all of the things i've said in this interview mm. um number one you are not going to make cereal take the pressure off yourself yeah just if you're going to do it have your own goals know what you want to achieve and make that your standard. Your standard is not what NPR standard is. Your <laughs> standard is not what BBC standard is. It's your personal standard. Mm -hmm. uh, number two, I would say plan. Plan, 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 plan. Because you will avoid so many pitfalls in the future if you have a good plan going into what you're wanting to do. And if it's a case of, you know, per story, for the series of the podcasts you're doing, whatever, just write it down on paper and have like tangible goals that you can like cross off a list because it can get really discouraging if you are, you know, are hours of tape in and you have no idea where you're going. And then I think my final one would be on the technical side, headphones, headphones, headphones. Always wear headphones. It's the easiest thing in the world. And you would be like surprised at how many people don't do it like professional people that just have too much faith in their recorder and their ear and they don't realize that you need to be listening to what you're recording yeah those are my three hot tips excellent thank you so much that was absolutely fascinating brilliant um i hope it's i'm sure it will be helpful to those who are sort of thinking of diving into the world of podcasts yeah and um yeah look forward to hearing what people people come out with thanks very much <laughs> So there it is. That was my conversation with Emily Elias. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you found it entertaining, engaging, useful. I think she gave some really valuable insights into the process of uh, creating a podcast around your research. And if you haven't, I've already urged this, if you haven't already listened to some of the big, uh, uh, the Oxford Sparks Big Questions podcast, please do so. Just, I think Emily's style, her sort of informal, engaging style, uh, and the really captivating way she tells the stories is something that everybody can emulate when it comes to creating their own research-focused podcast material. So go away, have a listen, enjoy, and um, yeah, I will uh, be back again before too long. <laughs>